So welcome back to the Cocos Lectures. We are in module six of our series uh, and we're going to talk today about Fortran and Python interoperability and then we'll talk about uh, how to interact with distributed memory systems via MPI and also PGAS. As always, all our online resources are there. I uploaded the slides, so if you go to the Cocos Tutorials, uh, Wiki Cocos Lecture Series, you'll find the link to these slides if you want to follow along on your own. Um, we also, uh, you know, have as always our Cocos Slack. If you want to join there, you know, talk to us, uh, feel free to do so. So, as I said, we are in module six. Uh, we largely got through, uh, you know, all the uh, baseline Cocos kind of capabilities. We talked about, you know, all the parallel dispatch, about data structures, how to manage memory, how to manage hierarchical uh, systems, uh, how to, you know, express all your parallelism. We talked last week about tasking and streams and SIMD. And today we're gonna talk more about uh, how you interoperate with, uh, other things you know you know, might need to do like uh, Python, Fortran, MPI. Uh, next week we're gonna hit tools. We talk uh, gonna talk about profiling and tuning and debugging and things like that. And then in the last module we'll see and talk about uh, the math kernels. So uh, there were some exercises last time, in particular for SIMD types. Uh, we talked last week about those, uh, how they help you vectorize code. We talked about uh, how they in particular help you with outer loop vectorization. Um, we introduced the concept of storage and temporary types for uh, SIMD types, which help us with uh, writing portable code between CPUs and GPUs. And uh, you know that you can download with uh, the SIMD library at Coco SIMD math. Uh, it's still considered experimental, but on its way to become, you know, a mainstay thing for Cocos. Another thing we talked about last time was uh, the, the general blocking behavior of Cocos and, or, and how it interacts with streams. That's actually something we're going to use later today in the MPI uh, discussions in order to help you understand how to uh, write uh, code which can overlap communication and computation. Uh, as a review of that, we introduced you know, execution space instances and how each of these instances executes work in order of dispatch. Uh, we talked about how the work dispatch to different execution space instances can in principle overlap with each other. Uh, and we talked about the different ways of fencing where Cocos fence would fence all the outstanding work while uh, the member function fence on an execution space instance only waits for completion of all work dispatched to that specific instance. Okay, before we hit today's uh, topic, I'm gonna walk through the SIMD exercise. And uh, show you hopefully also a little bit uh, how how well that works, you know, and how the, what the impact of, uh, of the uh, simile types of simulation is on performance. So I'm, this. I am currently in the uh, exercise directory of the Cocos tutorials uh, in the simd directory. Uh, as always, I have in home, uh, my username, Cocos, Cocos is the baseline Cocos uh, clone from GitHub. So that's all the setup. Uh, so let's go to the beginning of the SIMD exercise. And uh, we can just check for you know, all the places where we find all caps exercise. Uh, so there's a few of those. First, we need to include the SIMD header, uh, just with simd.hpp. Uh, and now we need to define what our SIMD type is. And for this exercise, we're just gonna use a very simple uh, one. We're gonna use uh, the SIMD colon uh, SIMD double uh, 
and then uh, use as ABI the uh, SIMD ABI native. If you remember that was the, the ABI was the way of you know choosing what kind of uh, uh, SIMD type you want. Now we're gonna uh, change the uh, the uh, the type of the scalar of our views, and we're just gonna use the uh, SIMD T here. But we need now to change another thing. Instead of using the n here, which is uh, uh, you know was the original uh, number of uh, scalar elements, we need to divide that uh, and get the size of the SIMD type because we have now that many that fewer elements. Yeah. So the the other thing is we're gonna use a scalar view of our of our results vector. And to get that, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna actually create an unmanaged view. So what we do is we, uh, we, convert, uh, we convert our, uh, our pointer data. We get from, the, uh, get from the results view, which returns like a pointer to SIMD. And now, we're actually going to use uh, n in here again. Okay. Now, for the deep copy operations, we also need to convert the a and the zero to SIMD types because we have to, uh, you know, uh, copy the correct types. So we can just construct them from that. This constructor of the SIMD type will just fill every element with the with the corresponding value. Um, now we need to change one more thing. We need to change our temporary type also to a SIMD type. And the assignment here should just work. And uh, then the only last thing we need to do is we need, actually that's probably it already. We don't need really to do anything more. Um, Okay, so that's that. Is there another exercise thing? No. Now we can check whether I actually did a decent job. We'll just compile this for OpenMP. Uh, and do Cocos Arch X. Probably I screwed something up. Why oh, didn't? Very good. Now let's run this, and what this does is it actually compares uh, two different versions of the code. Um, we go back in this exercise. It actually compares uh, a scalar loop here with the uh, with the SIMD loop. Right. And what we see here is we get a bit over three x uh, performance improvement. What I did here, if, if you looked at the, my command line, I compiled for Skylake down here, uh, which has four white double vectors, right? It has like these 512-bit uh, uh, vectors. Actually, oh, 256 on this one. Uh, yeah, and, and if we had compiled just uh, for Sandy Bridge, uh, you see now changed here to AVX from the AVX2 stuff. Uh, you see at that point we only get a bit better than, than uh, 2x improvement here. So uh, it matters what you compile for, right, to get the correct vector length. One last thing on that exercise, if you look in the, in the make file, uh, it really didn't, it's, it looks like the normal make files, the only thing it did is it added the include path to the, uh, to the SIMD math here, which was also checked out into the Cocos directory. So if you look at the trot Cocos SIMD math, that's where I checked this thing out from GitHub. Okay, that was this exercise. Uh, now let me show one last thing show you here. Uh, if I compile this for CUDA, 
it also will work, but it doesn't it doesn't really change any performance here. Which and we wouldn't we wouldn't really expect it to see change any performance. But uh, both codes, both versions of the, the loop still work and do the right thing. Uh, what happens here is because we use SIMD native, the SIMD type actually is only one double long. And uh, because our layouts do the right thing, we already get the outer loop vectorization effectively uh, for free. There's the second exercise, which is the SIMD uh, warp exercise. And if we go into that one, um, the idea here is to use uh, to use the uh, the SIMD warp uh, ABI or the CUDA warp ABI, and uh, that will give us actually vectorization via the team policy and what was the thread vector range inside of the SIMD types. So let's try that. Uh, We'll use a different type def here, depending on whether we compile for CUDA or not, because the, the CUDA warp ABI is uh, specific to, uh, to CUDA. So, uh, no. the type we use here is again double. Now we use the SIMD, SIMD ABI, uh, CUDA warp, uh, let's do a CUDA warp 16. Okay. You can actually choose what size this is. So this is similar to the capability of like our vector uh, range and team policy that it can, uh, uh, that it can uh, do, you know, sub warp parallelism. And in the other case, we're just gonna use, uh, um, we're just gonna use, actually we can just use pack 16. Let's see what happens with that. Okay. Now, let's change the storage type here. Or let's figure out the storage type. What this is, is just the, uh, you know, uh, the thing we use to store our data as opposed to do variables inside of our loops. So we still need to divide by the size here. Now what we're gonna store is we're gonna store this SIMD storage T type for both of them. And uh, we already converted the N here. Now you misspelled it. Yeah, that would be something the compiler probably finds. Uh, and now uh, we, oh no, we leave this here. We use the scalar thing here, so we'll convert back to double star. Probably some of my team members are gonna scream at me that I use a C cell cast here. Uh, Beta, comma, and M. So this was the scale two. One thing for the two dimensional ones, right? It's really important to make sure that you uh, do it on the right one, right? The, but I, as in this case, uh, the N is, you know, the first dimension is supposed to be the the, the folded into the SIMD type, right? So that means I need to make the first dimension here uh, the eight long. If I had made that guy here eight longer than, or 16 longer, that would have been a problem. Okay. So now we need to fill this thing. For that one, we actually need to use the, Do we need to do it? Yeah, I think we need to use the stop simply storage T type here. Actually, no, we, uh, we are co we're copying into the scalar here. Uh, sorry, we don't need to do that. So we don't need to change that. Then we need to use the team policy here. Uh, so we'll just start with a team policy. One important thing about this now is that uh, we obviously have uh, 
the data extent here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, just the one here for now, a team size of one. And we need to match the uh, vector length to what you use for your uh, for your type up here. Okay. So now what we get is we get uh, uh, we get a different guy out of that. In particular, we're going to get the focus uh, in policy number type my team type const. Now we still need our i. Uh, the int i is now the team dot peak rank. We need to use the right type here, and because it's a temporary type, we use the sim dt. Okay. Now we can convert this guy from the storage type to the uh, to the sim dt type, and then the conversion back happens. Uh, automatically. So I think that was it. Let's try this out. What did I do? Oh my goodness. Apparently GCC8 doesn't like the annotations. Great. So this is the SIMD host. Uh, you see, we already used the thread vector time here. Also we already parallelized that with a vector loop, and that's roughly uh, the same performance. Now let's do the cooler version. See what we get here. So we get right now 30 versus 45. The reason is that I think we used a 32 byte vector length in the in the uh, in the in the thread vector version. If we change this here also to 32, we should hopefully get uh, the performance back. And then I'll just show you what the actual, you know, code complexity difference looks like. Let's try that. Hopefully I'm right. Yep. So now we have the SIMD type and the thread vector type uh, being the same. And if you look at that, what you see here is, um, so this was the SIMD version, right, where I just have a normal loop in here and uh, the thread vector range stuff is essentially hidden inside of all the vector operations. While in the, in the scalar version, I had, uh, I had explicitly split my range here by V, right, did essentially this outer loop uh, vectorization. I figured out my I from the team link rank and then I, I split the range over i, right, uh, in two loops, the outer loop and then this nested inner loop with a thread vector range, right? This is this, uh, you know, conversion where I do the, uh, where uh, what we talked last week about, where you get outer loop vectorization by essentially splitting your uh, outer loop into two, uh, two different loops and then kind of inverting the loop order. Uh, but the point is that you can, while that works, and that works, you know, that approach works on CPUs and GPUs, uh, you can get the same effect just with the SIMD types. Okay. Now, uh, that was that. With that, I'm going to go back to our presentation if there's no particular questions on this issue. But if there are, you know, you also can uh, ask us on Slack later. Okay, let's go into full screen mode. 
So today we're going to talk first about uh, language interoperability. We're going to talk about how you write hybrid Fortran applications. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, how you interact with Python, which is actually uh, a capability which is in pre-release. So uh, we haven't quite made that public yet, but we are uh, we would really like to get uh, people to give us feedback on that and uh, we can provide access to that capability. Uh, then a larger part will be spent on talking about interoperability with MPI. So we'll uh, learn a bit how to, you know, make that work, how to develop code which uses both MPI and Cocos. Uh, we will actually spend quite a bit of time on talking about how to overlap a communication with computation and what you kind of need to look out there for. And then we're going to talk about uh, how you uh, can handle buffers with sparse indexing, and in particular also how you generate like sparse index lists. Uh, and last not, but, but not least, we're going to talk about interoperability with PGAS. Uh, that's essentially global address spaces. Effectively, we give you something like uh, global arrays with views. This is a really new capability. We just made that public uh, a few weeks ago, but we feel that it is something which in the future might be interesting to a lot of people. Okay, but let's start, get started with Fortran. Uh, so what I want to talk about here in this subsection is I want to tell you about how you write hybrid Fortran Cocos codes, in particular, how you allocate data in Fortran and then can see the same data without making extra copies as Cocos views on the C++ side. Uh, we're also gonna show you a little bit about how you call uh, C++ functions with Cocos in it from Fortran. And then uh, the last thing is we'll talk about how to allocate dual views from within Fortran. So, why do we care? Uh, we care because uh, a lot of HPC codes are still in Fortran and uh, porting those is, you know, quite of a bit of a daunting task. Uh, generally, you can't really port them all at once and, uh, you know, so you need some kind of incremental strategy to do that. And that means you can, in particular, uh, you know, you can uh, keep, uh, the Fortran kind of main drivers, etc., cetera, uh, still there in Fortran. And what you do is you uh, start with porting just like hotspot sections of your application. Uh, generally, the reason why people want to do that and while a lot of teams actually have started doing, going down with approaches that, uh, you know, generally support for Fortran is starting to be lagging a bit behind or quite a bit behind. Uh, C++ on all these new architectures and a lot of innovation in terms of new kind of capabilities and uh, and uh, new kind of features how we get exposed are just getting exposed via, uh, via C++. I mean, that's not, uh, you know, that's why things like HIP, you know, for example, are coming out and, uh, and uh, DPC++ from Intel and stuff like that. All of that is targeting uh, C++ while uh, DOE then has to pay for actually uh, Fortran development so that we at least get OpenMP support on these different architectures. So the question now is, uh, the question now is how do we make Cocos and Fortran actually talk with each other if we want to do this kind of incremental porting? And that is where the Fortran language compatibility layer uh, comes in. Uh, so what that provides is it provides uh, the capability of passing multidimensional arrays across the C++ Fortran boundary. Uh, in particular, it allows you to have Fortran arrays and Cocos view aliases, alias each other. Uh, there's also the capability of creating Cocos views and dual views uh, from the Fortran side. In particular, the dual view capability is kind of useful because it allows you to also allocate like uh, effectively CUDA memory on the, or HIP memory on the Fortran side. Uh, then you can initialize and finalize Cocos, which is, uh, you know, important if your main driver is actually uh, in Fortran. And the last thing is we're going to not talk much about, well, I'm not talking about that really uh, today, is there is a little helper thing for the C++ side, which is Fortran index. Uh, 
And what that allows you to do is it allows you to essentially have uh, these kind of sparse data structures where you have in these index lists in there. Uh, the problem is on the Fortran side, all of these guys are one-based, while on the C++ side, you need to, them to be zero-based. And so if you use Fortran index T as your, as your scalar type, it will automatically do that shift by one uh, on the C++ side. So you can still have these arrays alias each other with the same memory and have your sparse data accesses actually work both on the C++ and the uh, Fortran set. Basically, the Fortran language compatibility layer allows you to incrementally port a Fortran code to Cocos. Let's start with the simple stuff. So there are simple bindings of Cocos initialize and Cocos finalize for Fortran site called Cocos underscore initialize and Cocos underscore finalize. There's actually two versions of initialize. One of them uh, passes the command line arguments of the executable, while the other one doesn't do that and it, uh, but it will still look on the C++ side uh, up all the environment variables, right? Uh, and so all the command line arguments in Cocos have environment variable uh, correspondent, and, and so you can just uh, use that as well. But there's really nothing, nothing complicated about this, right? But this is just uh, it's calling these initialize and finalize functions. The kind of main thing of the compatibility layer is uh, this ND array T thing. And what that is, is it's essentially the compatibility glue between Fortran arrays and Cocos view. What it does is it keeps track of an array's rank, it keeps track of the extents of the array, and the strides of the array, as well as the pointer to the allocation. And so on the Fortran side, you can create such an ND array T thingy, either explicitly, there is uh, there's explicit functions which encode explicitly in the name, uh, you know, what is the scalar type. So this i64, for example, would mean 64-bit integer and the d6 means uh, rank six. Or you can just call this 2nd array function, hand it a Fortran array, and what you get back is you get one of these nd array t types back, right? Uh, and that thing then allows you to write a simple hybrid code. So uh, what we thought is we show you actually an example of how this whole thing works. And uh, you know, what is there a better example than XP because everybody loves XP. So uh, the way this works is on the Fortran side, right? You just need to use a couple modules. In particular, you need to use the ISO C, plus, uh, ISO -C binding and well, then the uh, the LFCL mod, which is the module provided by the compatibility layer. Um, so that's the thing which has all these functions defined and the types defined and stuff like that. Uh, so XB in this case here, with XB function down here, is just a Fortran subroutine. It just takes Fortran arguments, right? Like, so X is just, you know, these typical Fortran uh, allocatable arrays. Uh, we also call Cocos Initialize and Cocos Finalize in, in this program, you know, before we go into, into this XP. So, the more interesting thing sits in this XP module, uh, which we wrote, we have down here the subroutine, this, uh, this XP subroutine. Again, that thing just takes like Fortran arrays. And what we then do is we, uh, uh, we call from where this, this interface routine uh, fxb. And what it does is in this case, we convert the y and x or we get the, N, the ND array types from that thing, right? The, these handles which, uh, which allow us to pass information to, to C++. And so we call through to that thing up here. It takes these two, two ND arrays and it's actually bound to uh, the, uh, the C version of a function, right, via the ISO C binding. And uh, that's why we had to convert so that, uh, uh, that it actually gets a type on the other side, you know, the C side uh, or the C++ side knows about. So if we look then at how that side looks like, uh, basically what you do is you include the, uh, the uh, FLCL CXX header. And uh, the CXP function on that side essentially takes a pointer to the 
these ND array T types, okay? Uh, you have to mark them as X turn C, right? So the interface up here can't be templated or anything like that, right? Because it's just the C interface. That's why it takes this kind of uh, string. But what you can do then is in the body of a function, you can actually now convert and use C++. So uh, you, there's this function view from ND array. And what it does is it takes this, this little struct with all the information in it, you know, about what, the, what, is the, what are all the strides, the extents, et cetera and then creates the, the Cocos view from that. Uh, and after that, you can just use that. You can just run parallel force and whatnot, right? A couple notes on that. So all the arrays are essentially layout left. You know, if you just create them from a full uh, uh, Fortran array, there is cases where it could be uh, uh, layout stride, right? If you had like, uh, uh, like a, a sub, subarray on the Fortran side. Um, one important thing, this guy here, right, this double star, needs to match whatever the array was you created on, uh, you know, whatever the Fortran array was, right? If you had a two-dimensional Fortran array, you better have here double star star, right? If your Fortran array was integers, you better make sure that the type here uh, matches. Okay. But basically, that allows you, you know, basic interoperability and uh, you can do a lot of that with that. Uh, note that all the Fortran arrays were obviously uh, in, uh, in the host view. So uh, the views on the, you get on the other side are also like the, just the host views and you then have to create the mirrors for like uh, CUDA space or whatever you want to, uh, where you, you want to execute in. Okay. Another thing you can do is you can allocate dual views from a Fortran site. And basically how that works is there's this, uh, there's this Cocos allocate dual view function there. And what that returns, it, it returns uh, two things. So it has two output parameters, right? One is just the array type, you know, whatever arrays you want to create. Uh, we, and that's the Fortran array. And what it does is it will essentially alias the host view of the dual view. The other thing you get is you get a pointer. And the pointer is actually a pointer to the dual view uh, class instance itself, okay? You can't really do anything with that on the Fortran side. The only thing you can do with that is passing it on to, uh, to uh, uh, C++. And once that's what then happens on the C++ side. On the C++ side, you get uh, the, the dual view type and uh, you know, it's very explicit here. This R64 means it's uh, a floating point or real type, or, you know, 64 bit as a basically double. The 1D says it's a 1D type. And what you get is you get a pointer to a pointer of a, of a, of a dual view. And you can then, you know, just get the real dual view out of it and you can just call swing device on that, et cetera. Uh, you can do that assignment. This thing is still gonna be reference counted. So this Cocos allocate dual view actually calls obviously a C++ function, which then creates the dual view and returns back the, the pointer to what it created. Uh, so all the reference counting, et cetera, works. Um, and again, you know, there's no type safety, right? In the Fortran C++ boundary. If you screw up this type here compared to what you did here, you know, if that wasn't a, a double uh, array, right? But like a float array or an int array or something like that, then, uh, you know, this thing will just give you garbage data. So better get that right. So how does that look like when we write uh, our interface? Basically, uh, you have this, uh, this C function, right? Which takes these two pointers, right? And then you have, uh, on, on the other side, you know, you might have this, this function foo, which, which takes a, uh, uh, you know, this, this pointer, and then it's just bound to the C foo function, uh, you know, getting this, uh, this pointer in. Yeah. So all in all, what this allows you to do is it, the, the Fortran language compatibility layer allows you to uh, interoperate between Cocos and Fortran. You can initialize and finalize Cocos. Uh, ND array T is this representation of a Cocos view with all the extents, et cetera, in it. And you can create that from, uh, from a Fortran array uh, and then hand it off to like uh, C function or C++ functions. Uh, you also can allocate dual views with like this Cocos allocate dual view function. 
And uh, you can download this at Cocos, Cocos Fortran Interop, uh, and feedback is very much appreciated if you have any. Okay, are there any questions I should answer for this? Or go on. No question. Okay. So the same thing we did for Fortran uh, a while ago, um, we actually started uh, working on something for that for Python because people asked for it. And so we have this Python interoperability uh, layer as well. And uh, what it allows you to do, it allows you to allocate data in Python and view it as Cocos views, or you can allocate data in C++, you know, or, or you can allocate Cocos views and view them as these NumPy arrays. So why do we generally need that? Um, Kind of, it's kind of the opposite story of uh, Fortran, right? Well, in Fortran, it's because we have all these legacy apps, which, uh, which you know, where these big drivers are still all written in Fortran and you want to incrementally port. It actually is becoming really common to write HPC applications where the, uh, where the skeleton of the application is actually written in Python and only like the, the compute intensive parts are written in something like C++. And the reason for that is largely that Python is really good, you know, in doing a lot of things like data pre-processing and post-processing, you know, you can do visualization from it relatively easily. Uh, you can manipulate data, right? There's all these packages available which can talk to or understand like YAML and JSON and stuff like that. And it's relatively easy to write uh, these kind of uh, things, right? But Python has a problem that it's, you know, not often not the most, uh, you know, efficient in doing actual computations. Part of that is that uh, you have this dynamic type system, right? You, uh, that means that there's a lot of like type checking going on when you do uh, all kinds of statements. Uh, we have a thing is that uh, the statements are not necessarily optimized for execution on a specific architecture. Right? So, uh, that means a lot, you know, it's, it's really common to write these kind of hybrid programs. And now the question is how can you make, uh, you know, how can you use Cocos on the C++ side and how do you, uh, you know, hand off data between these two parts? And uh, there are various methods or various options, you know, of how you can uh, do this interaction, how you get this interaction between Python and C++ going. Uh, what we ended up doing for now is we used the PyBind 11, uh, uh, module and uh, what it is is essentially a C++ template library that can map like C++ types and functions to Python. Uh, so why do you need that? Basically even while Python you know has uh, kind of a lot of similarities to C++ and how it works and how its syntax kind of works, it's uh, most popular implementations actually done in, in C, right? And it's kind of uh, C Python. And uh, so you need to kind of translate C++ code into, uh, into this like C Py, uh, Python API. And that's something this uh, PyBind 11 can do. Uh, the other thing we decided is that we focus on interoperability with NumPy, considering that it's kind of a de facto standard for arrays in Python. Uh, largely a NumPy array is actually very similar to what the Cocos dynamic view is, right? So it's an array with uh, a multi-dimensional array. Uh, and just that it has like a, a runtime kind of rank or it feels like a runtime rank. And uh, so it's, it's actually very light, similar to Cocos Dynamic View. So what we are trying to do is uh, we try to provide facilities to, for these guys to talk to each other. And uh, one of these, for example, is the uh, numpy.array uh, function, which, uh, which takes a, a Cocos View representation and uh, returns a handle to or a NumPy array, which you know, either can alias that thing or can be a copy, right? So this copy equal false means uh, that there's no deep copy going on, that these guys will alias each other. Well, if you had copy equal true, it would actually create a new allocation and do, a, uh, do an actual copy of the allocation. So similar to Fortran, uh, you can call Cocos initialize and finalize from Python. Uh, that's simply, you know, a function in the, in the Cocos module we provide. So there's an initialize and finalize function in that module. Uh, 
Uh, one caveat here is that if you call Cocos finalize, uh, because Cocos finalize on C++ side requires you that all the Cocos data has been deallocated already, uh, and you know there's no outstanding kind of reference counts. Uh, what the Cocos finalize in, in Python needs to do is actually needs to run the garbage collection. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it will do that. And in order for it to work, right, you have to call it uh, in a different, you know, in a scope which doesn't have like a reference to a Cocos view in it. Okay, let's look at a sim simple sample code for that. So uh, we start here in the main, right? You call, you do the Cocos initialize, you do the Cocos finalize at the end, which implicitly does the garbage collection. And then it calls this, this other function here. Uh, and so you can create a, a Cocos view in Python here. Uh, what this does is it, it you tell it, you know, the dimensions uh, via like an, uh, you know, integer array. Uh, so this would create a 2D array with which, which is 10 by 2 long. You tell it the type of the scalar type you want, in this case double, and you tell it the space in which you want to allocate it. So you could actually allocate it in CUDA space, for example. And then there's these, you know, helper functions and you, uh, you can ask it, you know, what its shape and stuff like that. You can print these guys. Uh, this numpy array view copy false, as I said before, that now creates a numpy array, uh, which aliases the same data as view. Uh, in order to build the whole thing, what you do is you start, you, uh, you know, you have to obviously find package Cocos. You also have to find package with PyBind 11, uh, which you have to use. Uh, you then build your library, right, your, your Cocos library, uh, link that together. And then you uh, create the, uh, the via this, this PyBind, uh, you know, CMake function, you can create the, the uh, PyBind 11 uh, uh, interfaces or bindings between Python and uh, Python and C++ in this case. Um, that happens in this example uh, code here. Uh, I'll show that in a second. And then you can use that right from, from your uh, Python script. So uh, let's look at some example code for that. So this would just be like a, uh, you know, your user library, right? And it has like a generate view function, which returns a view type. Uh, the generate view function really just creates that view and, uh, and fills it with something and returns it. The more interesting thing is, you know, what, is, what does this example uh, Python kind of binding thing looks like, which uses this PyBind11 interface. Uh, so there's this uh, macro here, right? Uh, which and within which you then uh, generate this this binding, right? So this would be the pointer to the C++ function. Uh, this is the Python function name you generate from that. Uh, you know, you give it the documentation string and the arguments with uh, the defaults potentially. And what you then do in Python is, right, you can now call this, uh, call this generate view function from the example, uh, from the example module. As I said, this is in free release. Ask us for access. We really would like to have some people, some more people, look at that, you know, so that we can get it in better shape, uh, uh, better shape for uh, for a full release. Um, but it's working right now. You know, you can initialize, finalize Cocos. Uh, you can. Uh, create views from Python, you can alias, you know, Cocos views with NumPy arrays. Um, instead for now, this relies on PyBand 11. And so we are looking on uh, feedback on functionality and usability. Okay, I saw there was a question on whether you could actually create like a view in CUDA space and then have that with, interact with like QPy or something like that. And the answer is yes, that should actually work and uh, like Jonathan who wrote this, uh, tested with a little bit, but uh, you know, as said, since this is in pre-release, it's not as robust yet as some other stuff, but in principle that should work and that's intended functionality.
Okay, are there any other questions on the Python stuff? If not, I would go on. There is a question about what release of Python. What? What release of what version of Python is it intended to work with? Oh, I'm pretty sure this is Python 3 something, right? Yeah. Yeah, we can, we can get the answer later. I think the author of this isn't currently online, but uh, yeah, this is Python 3. Okay, in that case, let's go on with the MPI interoperability. Uh, so what we want to talk about in this section is how you, uh, how you write hybrid MPI uh, Cocos programs. Uh, Largely, we want to talk about how you send data from Cocos views, how you overlap communication and computation. We're going to talk a bit about buffer packing strategies and then in particular about how to generate sparse index lists. So why do you need that combination of MPI plus Cocos? Uh, yeah, while we, you know, while there's a big problem in all these new supercomputers with, you know, everybody using kind of different architectures and different node level architectures and different GPUs and different programming models, etc. cetera. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there's still nodes, tons of nodes, and you have to talk to them somehow. And Cocos itself, right, is a shared memory programming model. So it actually can't really do that, right? It can't like uh, on its own, uh, you can't run a kernel, you know, a parallel four right now, which uh, spans like the whole machine, right? And goes over multiple nodes. So you need something else for that. And uh, that's something else, you know, for a lot of people is MPI because, you know, that's what we anyway use. So why would you mix MPI with Cocos? Yeah, obviously you need to somehow address the internode data transfer. Uh, it said MPI is the de facto standard right now. That's the that's the thing, you know, which is, you know, the most robust of the internode communication models uh, in terms of actually working on all these platforms. Uh, it's reasonably well supported on all of the platforms. Uh, MPI can actually also knows actually how to talk to GPUs uh, nowadays. And uh, then, you know, often people who start using Cocos start using it because they actually are porting some existing code. And almost always, that existing code was written in MPI anyway already. Uh, on top of it, uh, programming explicitly to the parallelism hierarchy, you know, explicitly to the fact that you have uh, distributed memory can uh, potentially help performance wise. And so MPI is uh, relatively good in, in, you know, doing that. But there are some alternatives. One of them we're gonna discuss later, uh, which is the, this PGAS model, or essentially global arrays kind of programming model. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that uh, at the end of today's uh, lecture. But there's also global tasking models, uh, which may work for you. So uh, we've been working with different uh, kind of uh, tasking model implementers for a while. Uh, we have been working with Uinter from the Utah University, for example, for years. And so they have a global tasking model with like, uh, with like data dependencies and stuff like that, uh, which, which uh, can leverage Cocos for the node level parallelism. And uh, that has been working for years and they've been doing like large scale simulations of that. Uh, then Los Alamos actually explores combining Legion with Cocos and we are supporting that. And that is, uh, pretty much working, right? I mean, it's uh, still some, you know, a bit rough around the edges, but uh, basically that is working also with like support for GPUs and stuff like that. And that allows you to express, you know, your, your entire large scale parallelism, right? Via tasks. And then the tasks themselves internally have like Cocos data parallelism in it, like Cocos parallel force and stuff like that. Another model uh, we work with is HPX. And uh, that's also one of these, uh, you know, uh, tasking models which can work across the whole system. So, you know, that is something which is in the works, you know, some of it actually works already. And, you know, if you're interested in that, talk to us on the Slack channel and we get you in contact with the right people to figure out how this works. Okay, but let's come back to MPI. Uh, where is this, uh, you know, a simple motivating example. It's essentially just, uh, you know, shifting of a vector 
So you do a, uh, you have two vectors and you do a pro four, right? And you want to shift it by uh, K elements. So you read from AI and you, uh, you write into I plus K. Uh, this modulo operation here just makes sure that you wrap around, right? When you reach the end of a vector. So that's relatively simple. But let's assume we now want to distribute that over R MPI ranks. First of all, each of these ranks now owns only N over R elements, right? What then happens is that in order to do the same operation, rank J needs to send K elements to rank J plus one, right? And it's actually sending the last K elements of A. Rank J also needs to receive K elements from its preceding rank, J minus one. And what it receives there is it receives k elements into the beginning of B because it will in its local kernel not write the first k elements of B. Okay. So the way you do that, right, is uh, in MPI is via sending explicit messages. And uh, the MPI interface basically uses raw pointers for that. And so uh, what you do is you just get the pointers to the underlying allocations of the Cocos views, right? So if you have a receive view as a view you want to receive in and a view you want to send from, you know, you just get the data pointers out of it. Uh, one thing for that is, you know, the data needs to be stored contiguously, right? Layout stride is not, uh, at least not easily possible, right? There is these MPI data types and in principle that allows you to send like strided data uh, and that should work, right? Uh, if you, put it all together correctly. Uh, but you know, in, in simple cases, you know, leave it contiguous and then everything is kind of simple. Uh, while I said earlier that the MPI knows usually how to talk to MPI, uh, to the GPUs, if you end up with, you know, on one of these systems and uh, the MPI awareness doesn't work, uh, or the GPU awareness of the MPI doesn't work, uh, you may need to copy stuff to the host, right? So what you would do is you would create a mirror view and just copy it to the host and then you get the data pointers from the host views. After that, all the usual MPI functions work. You can just hand that pointer, you know, you, you tell it the size of your view, you tell it the type of the scalar type, you tell it, you know, the, uh, the rank to send to or receive from, uh, you know, your tag for the stuff, your communicator, your requests and stuff like that. And it all just kind of works. So it's really not uh, particularly complicated. Uh, in our case for the shift example, right, I said we want to send the last K elements of A and we want to receive in the first K elements of, of B. So what we can do is we can make our send view and our receive view just sub views of A and B, right? So you just use the make pair, you get a sub view of the last k elements and uh, a sub view of the first k elements of B, right? And that's when you receive and you send view. Now, you also can overlap communication with computation and you really should try and do that if, you, if possible. So uh, how you do that is you need to make sure that uh, generally you should make sure that the compute kernel doesn't really access send and receive buffers. What you then do is you first post your sends and uh, receives, then you launch your compute kernel, and then you wait on MPI. And so in the shift example, how it looks like is you get the subviews of A and B, you post your MPI, I receive and I send, you start your parallel four, note that in the parallel four here, I only go over uh, uh, from K to my N, right? So I skip over first elements of B, and I'm not going to access the last k elements of, uh, of A. Uh, and then you wait for the communication to finish, which writes these, la uh, you know, these first elements of B. Okay. Some technical requirements generally initialize MPI before Cocos. So you just call MPI init and then Cocos initialize. Uh, same way when you kill it again, right? Call Cocos finalize and then MPI finalize. By default, what we do is we uh, distribute GPUs round robin, uh, no, in uh, for ranks. Um, and one easy way to get 
everything compiled is you use MPI CXX as your compiler, and then you just tell it to, for example, use NVCC wrapper if you want uh, CUDA compilation to go as its uh, as its host compiler. With OpenMPI, you do that with OpenMPI CXX. The other option is you just use find package MPI and CMake, and then CMake is adding all the you know necessary includes and libraries and stuff like that to your uh, to your link and compile lines. We have an exercise for that, uh, a simple exercise. That's the MPI pack and unpack exercise. And what you need to do is you need to just add all the missing MPI calls to the run pack com unpack test. Uh, then you can run that and you can actually see uh, like a bit of performance. Um, so it also has the capability in, if you look into it, you can actually choose kind of what is the pack and unpack buffer and stuff like that. And we're actually gonna talk about that in a second. Um, so this, this example, this exercise already uses explicit send receive buffers. This is because, you know, often you kind of need to do that. For example, if your compute you want to overlap with uh, needs to, or is gonna write to stuff you first have to send, right? Then it makes sense to copy that data into send and receive uh, into a send buffer and then start your compute kernel, right? So now you can safely overwrite it because you already, the stuff you have to send and you have copied that somewhere else. The other thing is that you need to use those if you want to send uh, or receive sparse data, in particular, if it's not regular strided and you know, these MPI data types definitely wouldn't work. And we'll discuss some best practices on that in a bit. Uh, you also need to use send receive buffers if your MPI doesn't uh, allow you to access some memory space. So how does that generally work? What you do is you post your I receives, you pack your buffers, you post your I sends, and then you wait on message completion and then you unpack your buffers, right? That's kind of a, a standard kind of approach for uh, getting the maximum overlapping of like communication flow with packing and unpacking and stuff like that. So, but based on our knowledge, right, we, of execution and memory spaces, there's actually some an interesting question of where should you run the pack kernels and where should you pack to, right? Generally, the answer for the first is run the pack kernel wherever the data lives you need to pack, right? As a, the, the original data. Um, but the best memory space to pack into depends. Say you run, for example, on CUDA, right? Uh, and your original data is in CUDA space. You obviously want to run, uh, you know, your, your packing kernel in, the, in, in CUDA. But you could pack into, uh, you know, a CUDA space buffer. You could also pack into a CUDA UVM space buffer. You could also pack into a CUDA host pin uh, space buffer. All of these have different, uh, different properties, right? For example, packing into a CUDA host pin space means that you already pack into something via like your link to the CPU, which lives in more or less CPU memory. And it's also memory, which is directly RDMA accessible by the NIC, right? So, uh, and it, but it really depends what is the best, right? Then on top of that, you also have the choice, you first pack into, uh, into a device buffer and then explicitly copy your stuff to the host, right? Uh, before you give like a host pointer to the MPI. And all of these things have different performance characteristics. Uh, and what we did here is we collected some data on, uh, on essentially a node which is like Summit or a system like Summit. Uh, and, uh, we compared in the uh, earlier exercise the CUDA space versus CUDA UVM space versus CUDA host pin space for the buffer. And uh, what we're gonna show here is the time relative to uh, running CUDA space on a single socket, right? So essentially just doing an API communication between two GPUs in the same NVLink uh, uh, complex. So that means all the bars, you know, lower is better. And one means it's the same performance as if you had given, as if you had packed into CUDA space and handed the buffer directly to, uh, uh, to uh, MPI. Now, one thing you're gonna see here in a second when I show you the data is that some of the numbers just don't make much sense. And uh, at least at first, 
basically the performance of MPI on these GPU systems is very sensitive to the particulars of the system configuration, the particulars of the MPI configurations, the particulars of the driver configuration and stuff like that. Uh, so if you like load the new driver or you forgot to install, you know, like the PMM uh, NVIDIA driver module or whatever, or you configured your MPI slightly different, uh, you know, even things like uh, different settings in the BIOS, right, change the performance uh, quite significantly. Okay, with that warning out of the way, let's look a little bit at that. And let's start with the same socket. So this is two GPUs which actually live on the same NVLink co connection, right? So we can actually talk to each other directly. And one thing you see here is that uh, for the very small ones, right? So this is 10 uh, doubles, this is 10,000 doubles, this is 10 million doubles, right? Uh, for, the up, for even the 10,000 ones, right? We are basically latency limited. And you see that the CUDA host pin space actually outperforms the other guys uh, quite a bit. Even UVM space is faster in this case uh, than CUDA space. But if you were to copy first to the host, right, explicitly, uh, having packed into CUDA space is actually faster. This whole thing actually measured the whole packing, un, you know, packing, potentially copying, MPI sent receive, uh, potentially copying back, unpacking, right? It's the whole cycle. And what you see is, uh, you know, copying to the host gives you lower latency. For 10,000 elements, it's actually still quite a bit faster as if you had just given the pointer to MPI. But if you have larger messages, right, 10 million doubles here, uh, explicitly copying to the host uh, hurts, the, hurts the CUDA space performance quite a lot. Okay. If you go to different sockets, it looks kind of... Uh, kind of similar uh, performance drops a bit, you know, for like the, the, the UVM stuff. Uh, if you explicitly copy, uh, if you do not explicitly copy to the host, you know, it looks pretty similar uh, to the same socket thing. Interesting then is when you hit different nodes. So if you have like two ranks, on, one rank on, on two different nodes, right? The host pinned one still looks very similar to what we had before, right? Uh, the CUDA space is also kind of okay. Still interesting that it's, you know, uh, for small messages, it's still better to copy it to the host. For larger messages, you know, you better give the direct, uh, directly the buffer to MPI. But what really falls out of the scale here is CUDA UVM space. So when you hit different nodes, the giving CUDA UVM space uh, pointers to, the, to MPI, uh, completely, utterly obliterates your performance, right? I mean, this is going like to 32x, right? It's all way out of a, way out of a screen. So, um, you know, be aware of that. Generally, it seems that, you know, the most kind of reliable kind of performance you get if you actually pack into CUDA host pin space. That's the most predictable in terms of performance and the most, you know, the one which works reasonably well across the board. Okay, with that, let's come to uh, some more explicit overlapping and in particular if your situation gets a bit more complicated. And let's talk about uh, leveraging streams and Cocoa Space instances uh, to do that. So if you want to maximize your, your all this, you know, of overlapping of computation with packing, unpacking, and stuff like that, right? Uh, one thing you can do is you can uh, use different execution space instances. In particular, you use different execution space instances for packing and unpacking than the one which does kind of the kernel which works on, uh, on, the, on the data which doesn't need or doesn't interact with any of the things you had to exchange. One important thing here is that the submission order is still important. Uh, so when you, even if, if you dispatch work via execution space instances, um, in reality, in particular on, on like the GPUs, right? Uh, the GPU starts working on whatever was reached at first, 
right? So if you dispatch your heavy compute kernel with tons and tons of parallelism and using all the threads first, right? When your pack kernels will largely wait until that guy is done before we actually execute anything, right? Unless priority streams are a thing. So what you should do is you should submit your small kernels, the pack kernels first, and then the interior kernels in order to make sure that the, the packing actually is finished, you know, or first. What you then do is you fence the pack execution space instances only when you issue the sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you can receive the stuff, you fence everything and uh, start continue your, uh, your progress, right? One other thing, these execution space instances and buffers, you shouldn't create them in place, right? They should live persistently there. Because if you allocate data, as we discussed uh, last week, or you delete data, or you create execution space instances, these kind of things are often blocking operations. And so uh, you should keep these guys around so that you do not add additional blocking in offenses in your, uh, in your communication cycle. So how does that look as a code skeleton? You start with, you know, creating your, your execution space instances, you know, at least one for the packing, one for the computation. Uh, you post your MPI right, receives, you launch your pack kernels with the, execu with the execution space instance for packing. You launch your interior kernel, uh, you know, with a computation execution space instance. Then you just fence the packing, make sure that the packing is done before you issue your MPI. I sent uh, when you can wait for everything, uh, when you can parallel for, uh, you know, the, the unpacking, uh, again, in the execution space uh, with the packing, and then you wait for all the outstanding work. But what this means is that in principle, this, this uh, interior kernel can now overlap all the operations, right? So even though you started, for example, the pack buffer here, if it doesn't actually has enough, have enough parallelism to, uh, uh, to utilize all the, all the cores, right? It could potentially overlap with, with the uh, interior kernel. And you know, these guys don't need to use the same execution policy. They don't need to use the same, same range or something like that, right? But if a pack buffer only uses part of a GPU, right, the interior kernel here can already run while the packing is still ongoing, right? And so the execution pack fence would only wait on the work for the, for the pack buffer while the interior just starts, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And so it's still going after all of this MPI stuff potentially, which means that it still can overlap with the unpack buffer as well, right? So this is the way how you should, uh, kind of, you know, structure your MPI communication. There is a bit larger example, which actually is also an exercise. Uh, this is like a 3D simulation of heat conduction. Uh, actually, it's kind of like a black body, uh, you know, thermal radiation kind of thing in, in space. So you have heat conduction going on in the, in the interior of the, of the, uh, the system. On its surfaces, you have thermal radiation going out, you know, in each direction. And then from one direction to make it a time dependent problem, we have like incoming, incoming radiation for like half of a simulation time. Uh, and then basically what we did is we just wrote a simple kind of Euler integration uh, scheme. So it's a simple uh, structured grid uh, discretization. Uh, the heat conduction is just computed as kind of, you know, the, it's, it's just essentially the difference of the temperatures uh, to your neighbors. The thermal radiation uh, is uh, like just dependent on the, on the uh, no, fourth power of, uh, of, of, the, of the temperature at the surface. And then the incoming radiation is just a, a fixed kind of per time step uh, increase in temperature or delta T. Okay, so what is the data structures we have? We have T as the temperature in each cell of you know, the XYZ grid. We have DT, which is the temperature change in time in the time increment, uh, small dt. And there is a T left, right, up, down, front, back, 
uh, received buffers for the boundaries. And there's the T left out and T right out and stuff like that sent buffers for the boundaries. Okay, so that's all the data structures we have. And then uh, what you do in your time loop is you deep copy the boundary layers as needed to the contiguous send buffers. You post your MPI send receive uh, with these send receive buffers. You launch your kernels for the uh, uh, for the interior elements. You know, doing the heat conduction only. Uh, we wait for the MPI and we compute the updates for the boundary elements using the receive buffers. Okay. Um, now this is if we don't do overlapping. In order to overlap that, what you do is you pack and unpack the whole thing with, uh, as you want to overlap for packing and unpacking with the interior compute, you also want to overlap the interior compute with all the communication and stuff like that. Uh, and what you need to do for that is you need to split work a little bit more. So first of all, you need quite a few of execution space instances. You actually use one for each boundary direction and you use one for the interior. When you issue your I receives, you run up to six pack kernels uh, using the different execution space instances. You launch your interior kernel on its own instance. Then you fence each of these uh, uh, pack in instances and issue the I send. And you do that for every one of them, you know, one by one. After that, uh, you wait for the, all the MPI operations to finish before you issue your boundary uh, temperature update kernel. And then you fence uh, everything. Be done. Okay. So what we have here is we have an exercise for that uh, in the MPI heat conduction directory. And uh, it starts essentially with the MPI version, which doesn't do overlapping. And what you need to do is you need to use execution space instances you actually need to split a combined packing send receive uh, function into a separate stages of packing and uh, posting the send receives. Uh, you need to order the operations correctly for getting maximum overlapping and then hopefully run with the correct GPU mapping. Uh, if you do that, you know, you can try, you know, strong versus weak scaling. You can change the problem sizes. Uh, there's a minus H. If you type minus H on it, it will give you help. Uh, what are all the options? You can play with the buffer memory spaces, you know, which kind of space do you actually want to pack your buffers into? And then you can compare, you know, all these different uh, performance numbers. Okay. And obviously there's the begin and the solution folder again, so you can look up the solution as well. So in this heat conduction example, right, some surfaces were sparse, but they were still regular, right? So we could in principle come up with like an MPI data type, I think, to cover it. But how do you generate index lists if, you do, if your sparsity is not regular, right? In that case, you need kind of an index list to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are some problems, you know, where that happens, for example. Um, one of them is, you know, typical kind of particle simulations. And when a particle crosses like the boundary of the domain your process uh, owns, you want to pack that and send it off, right? So you have a kernel there. Uh, you basically figure out whether something needs to be sent or received by checking its location and checking whether it's outside of your current uh, subdomain. Uh, Similar things with like, uh, you know, when you, when you have like element-based uh, simulations uh, with like things like contact and stuff like that, uh, with also with things like mesh refinement and, and things like that. So what you do in these cases, you use an indirect pack kernel, right? You run a parallel four over all the uh, things you need to send and uh, you index into your data via a send list, right? By an index list. And then you pack it contiguously. Now, the interesting question is you know, how to generate that send list, right? And the answer to that is Perl scan. This was something we mentioned really early on in this lecture series, but we didn't really talk much about it. So what, what Perl scan does is it essentially does a prefix scan. 
And uh, in order to use that for, uh, for building a send list, what you do is you do a prefix scan over, uh, over the entire, uh, over, your, over all of your elements, right? And uh, then you, uh, you start packing only for things which need sending, right? The arguments here is the first one is just the index, right? You loop over all the elements. The other one is kind of, this IDX here is kind of like your, uh, your summation in, in, in a parallel reduce, right? Just that it uh, essentially is there for giving you the, the scanned value. Um, the last one is essentially whether or not uh, you are in the, uh, in the, uh, in the final stage of the scan. So in parallel, the scan actually potentially has to do a two pass algorithm, right? And only when final is true, IDX represents your prefixed scan value. So what we do is we only pack if final is true because when IDX is your prefix scan value, but independent of final, we always increment for IDX by one when the need sent is true, okay? So there's one question though, what happens if you do not know how big your sent list needs to be, right? When, if, you, if sent list is too small, right, and IDX gets too large, uh, you're screwed. But you also don't want to make sent list the number of elements. And uh, the answer for that is what we call the, the, the kind of count allocate fill pattern. And what we usually do is kind of a merged count allocate fill uh, pattern. And so effectively what you do is you guess what your uh, you know, sent list size should be. And then you run your kernel. But you make the, the assignment here, right? Make that not just conditional on being, on final being true, but also that IDX is smaller than your count. Uh, note, while it looks a bit funky, the IDX plus plus here happens independent of that condition, right? I just had to put it in the same line because I ran out of space. Uh, but what happens is there is a parallel scan version that takes an additional argument like the reduction. And what you get is you get the final sum like the, the biggest value of IDX, right? Or the biggest value plus one, right? Uh, and what you now can do is you can check whether that count is larger than the extent of sent list. And if yes, you just run with the whole scan again, right? You resize your sent list and you run the whole scan again, this time without checking, you know, whether, it, whether IDX is smaller than count because, uh, you know, as long as nobody else wrote anything to, uh, to your, uh, uh, to the data which determines whether need sent is true, you know, uh, everything should be fine. So people often say, oh, but now I have to run it twice, right? But the point is, worst case scenario is that this is two times the cost. First of all, often you will not run this thing a lot of times, you know, the second one, because if you keep count, you know, keep up where the count is, you often, in many, many issues, situations, you reach kind of a steady state. And so the, the uh, you know, sent list will just be large enough and everything will be fine, right? Uh, the other issue is that if you actually had something where you could like reallocate, uh, you know, on the fly, uh, your data structure, which keeps your sent list, for example, memory pool based algorithms and stuff like that, it often is true that the cost of that, doing that, you know, and the, the cost of, uh, of uh, the cost of like uh, data access in these more complex data structures, right, is actually large enough that it's, uh, that it's higher than, uh, than, you know, this 2x, right? So the 2x generally is, is actually a not too bad trade-off for something like this. Now, the last thing on the MPI thing I want to talk about is resource affinity. Ah. And we didn't update this. Okay. 
Uh, one important thing is CPU core assignment. Don't oversubscribe your CPU cores. By default, uh, you know, for example, the each rank of uh, of your MPI processes, if you run like with OpenMP, will potentially actually try to use all the cores on your node. So if you launch like eight MPI ranks on like a sixty on a thirty-two core uh, node, right? When each of these MPI ranks tries to launch 32, MP, uh, 32 OpenMP threads, and uh, and uh, that means you get uh, 32 times eight, right? You have eight times oversubscription of your course, and your performance will stink. So you need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, one other thing you need is you need to set the process mass appropriately, and there's different ways how to do that in. OpenMPI that goes with the map by thing and the typical thing you do is you map by socket and then you tell it how many processing elements or how many cores to use uh, per rank, right? And so uh, that would then give you correct like affinity mass. There's also ways of doing it with mpitch and slurm. Uh, unfortunately, we apparently forgot to push the update for that uh, to tell you that. Um, the other thing is GPU assignment. So what you need to tell Cocos is the number of GPUs you use per node with minus minus Cocos num devices or the environment variable Cocos num devices. And what then Cocos will do is it will assign GPUs round robin by MPI rank. Right? Uh, there's more fragility, for example, on Summit, you need to tell GS run to, uh, to actually enable uh, GPU awareness of MPI via this SMPI arcs uh, GPU argument. Uh, there's also a lot of other kind of options for MPI generally, uh, which tells it, you know, how to internally communicate, you know, for example, things like uh, up to which point do I uh, directly do RDME operations between uh, GPUs and NICs and stuff like that. And at, that, at which point do I do a staged kind of copy pipeline and stuff like that. And it's all complicated. It's, uh, we spent uh, weeks and weeks for every one of our applications on trying to figure out what the best options are. And then we stand, spend weeks again after an MPI upgrade. Um, but, um, you know, good luck. So to summarize, simple MPI and Cocos interaction is relatively easy. You just simply pass you know, your data pointers from your views to the MPI functions plus its size. And uh, you know, if you did it right and you actually have a contiguous view, then that should just work. Then you initialize Cocos after MPI and you finalize it before MPI and that's kind of the basics of everything. Uh, the overlapping stuff also works. Uh, and what you do there is you should probably use different execution space instances to overlap the packing and unpacking of other computation. And you need to order the operations correctly in order to maximize your overlapping potential. Okay, that was it on MPI. Do I have questions I should answer now? Um, Philip is asking precision about uh, some of the number you showed for summit, but we we can do that offline. Oh, you mean the the uh, the performance numbers there? Yeah. Uh, you know, from run to run, they they vary a little bit, right? But uh, this was reproducible, right? As a reproducible to a point where you know just glancing at the at the picture you couldn't see the difference right um okay with that let's get to coco's remote spaces uh and essentially what we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk about how we are supporting uh, uh partition global address spaces in cocos uh, this is a very new capability it's something we've been working on On with something we've been working on in order to support version of PGAS with NVshmem. Uh, 
And what it allows you to do is it allows you to effectively create uh, the equivalent to global arrays, right? You can create global views which span the entire system. You can access these views from, you know, kind of every node. And we'll, uh, we'll take a closer look at the sparse map back as an example of where this really simplifies your life. Okay, so we had this previous example, right? And it was a pretty straightforward example, uh, you know, this vector shift where you, where we, where we really just wanted to, you know, write with a little offset, right, from one array to another array. And we still had to do kind of a lot of things, right? We had to create these subviews, we had to do this I sends and I receives, uh, uh, run our kernel, and then do wait all, right? And the question is, can we, uh, you know, simplify that a bit. And one answer people have been investigating for a long time, and there's various models out there for that, is partition global address spaces. And what that does is essentially you allocate a data object which spans all the nodes, right, or processing elements. Uh, in most of these models, what you get is you get uh, uh, symmetric allocations, right? So the size on each of these nodes is the same. And because that is so often, the way you access them is via a first index, which is like, which node does it come from? And the second index will offset within, within that node, okay? And then you access the data just via puts and gets, right? You can read them, you can write them. Uh, you know, in some models you can update them, you can, uh, in some models you can atomically update them. Uh, and, and in a lot of them you can also do like bulk transfer. You can say, oh, I want to essentially the equivalent of moving a subview, right? There's various different implementations which kind of are conceptually similar. Uh, you know, one of the, or the two kind of most widely used in, or, Longest established, I would say, in like C and C world is probably OpenShmem and MPI one sided. So the OpenShmem it allows you to do these symmetric allocations, right? So you tell it how much size, how much space you want on every one, every one of these nodes. And then when you access it, when you want to put something, you tell it, you know, the destination pointer, which is essentially the, the offset within, within a local destination, and the, and the uh, the processing element it should go to. And the same way you, you read from somewhere and you give it the point of offset, you know, within that allocation uh, to read from. Uh, with MPY, you know, it's kind of the same. You have this MPI bin allocate, which allocates this, you know, distributed allocation. Uh, and you then tell it, you know, the, the pointers, you know, the offset pointers or whatever, the, how much, how much transfer you want to do and where to go to, right? The source and target be. Uh, NVIDIA came up with its own version of that and Shmem thing called, called NVShmem. They, they had been working on that for a few years. Actually, the first time we, they, they showed some results and some concepts of that was years ago on uh, GDC. And uh, we've been working with them on like uh, private versions of that for quite a while, but now it actually is public and you can download them, you can, you can get that. And what that allows you to do is it allows you essentially to use these kind of shmem put and get operations from within a GPU. And that actually works across nodes as well, right? So in principle, you could now write global arrays across uh, or shmem code, which spans like summit. So how does that work in, Coco, in, in, in our version of that, which we call Coco's remote spaces? So the base of everything is that you chase, change the memory space. So basically, instead of you know, using CUDA space or host space or whatever, you use a remote space, uh, like for example, shmem space or NV shmem space or MPI space or something like that. And then you create views. And right now what we do is we use explicitly the number of PEs as of the number of alloc uh, the number of nodes as the first kind of argument, right? Or the number of nodes that should spend this. Uh, and then the 
the local size as the second, third, and fourth, or whatever argument, right? Um, if you do that, you then can access this global memory, right? So A00 writes a six to the uh, to offset zero on processing on rank zero, right? One eight will write uh, to offset eight, you know, in rank one. Uh, all of this has like relaxed coherency. So these writes will only be guaranteed to be visible after you call a remote space fence. Okay. Note that that fence call is potentially uh, a global blocking operation, right? So you, every rank needs to call that. Similar to like an MPI barrier. Uh, you can also copy from one of these views into uh, into like a, a local uh, memory space, right? If you want to, but note that it only copies the, the locally owned elements right now, but we might change that in the future. So how does this vector shift thing now looks like? Uh, basically you, you just create your remote views, right? And you have them now being 2D views. And what you do now is you run over your local elements, right? So, uh, oh, that's a bit super. So you run over your local elements, you compute your J and your I. And what we did here is in this example, we essentially pretended uh, that I is supposed to be a global index. You could have also just have used a local index and then figured out, you know, what is the PE I need to get certain elements from. But this is essentially using complete global indices, right? I is now a global index, so is J. Now, to get from global indices back to, uh, to the PE, what you do is you divide by uh, your global index by the number of local elements on each rank. And then, because it might need to wrap around, right, you do the, uh, you mod it by numpees. Uh, your, your local index, right, as the offset is just computed as the, with a modular operation. Okay. Now, the more interesting thing is the, uh, the, the, the true sparse communication pattern, right, where, you actually save quite a bit of like coding effort. And the thing we're gonna look at here is the sparse matrix multiplying. Uh, so when you do that, right, when you have these kind of sparse operations, what you do is you, saw, you store like your sparse matrix in, uh, in like a specific storage format. And the most commonly used one here is the compressed row storage or CRS. And what that does is it stores only the non-zero matrix elements, and they're essentially sorted by occurrence, right? So you have them sorted by, by rows. What you then store is you also store the actual column index uh, associated with each of these values in a different array. And you have an offset array which tells you where each row of your matrix starts, okay? Uh, the single node implementation of that looks uh, kind of like this, right? You run your parallel four over the number of rows. Then within each row, you run a loop over, uh, you know, you figure out where each row starts in the value array and the index array. Uh, you start there, you go to the end of that row, and then you uh, sum to y, you know, the, uh, the value times the, the the x vector and the x vector is indirectly accessed, right? Because you need to, as a, since it's the dot product of a row of a matrix with a vector, right? You need to figure out where each of these values actually, uh, you know, what its column was, so that you know which x value to to multiply it with. Okay. Uh, when you distribute that kind of data, the most common way of distributing it is you just distribute it by rows, right? So every rank gets a certain amount of rows. It also gets a the same amount of elements from your, from your y vector and your x vector, right? Uh, and, but what now happens is that when you do the dot product of a row with the x 
right? For example, you have a first row, right? It doesn't just have green elements, it also has some blue elements. So it needs some elements from the this, this second rank, right? Uh, this one looks really nice because it's like kind of bandwidth optimized, as that's what it's called. So, uh, you know, everything is nice and compact, right? If your sparsity pattern is really complex, this can get, uh, you know, look way worse. So, because of the sparsity pattern stuff, you actually need a lot of setup. So first of all, you need to, in, in MPI, you need to figure out what is all the values of the index array, you know, for my rows, which are outside the, the range of indices I own for the vector X, right? Then you need to figure out for every one of these values what the rank is on which this value is supposed to be. Then you need to create for each of these ranks I need data from a list of indices. And now depending on the sparsity pattern, the number of ranks you need to communicate to, right, can be different. In the worst case, it actually can be an all to all. Uh, then what you need to do is you need to send the list of the elements you need to that other rank, and that other rank needs to store that list, right? So that it knows what to pack so you can send it to you. Uh, what, what you then do is instead of just having an X vector, which has only the length of you know, your own elements, you essentially extend it at the end and just have in a packed way, you know, the, the, the space, the receive space for all the elements, you know, you need from uh, the remote side which actually also means that you have to translate your indices, right? You have to translate your matrix indices from global indices to local indices, where part of the local indices are just these, you know, weird numbers uh, which point to the correct place in the, in the receive buffers. So the data structures you need for that is you need the num receive ranks, you need the num send ranks, uh, you need uh, receive buffers, which is actually a view of views, uh, Potentially, you know, the receive buffers are actually just subviews at the end of X. Uh, then you need the send buffers, which is the, you know, what do you need to send to each of you, the ranks which need data from you. Note that send and receive here is not symmetric, right? You might receive from less ranks when you send to, and you might, you know, that is not symmetric. Uh, and then you need the send list, right? Which is the elements you need to send to each of these guys. And then as the code skeleton, right, how this looks like is you post the I receives for every one of the ranks you need data from. Then you go over all the ranks you have to send data to. You pack your data via this, uh, you know, indirect packing using the send list for that particular rank. Uh, you wait for that to finish. You post your, your send for that, right? And then if you have done that for everyone, you have to send to, you do your MPI wait all, and then you can run the Perl 4 with the local code, which is essentially the same as we had before. Right. Now in PGAS, this is actually quite a bit easier. First of all, only X is actually distributed, right? The only guy where you need remote access from where you actually have inter-node communication happening is X. All the variables of A, you know, the, the values, the indices and stuff like that, as well as of Y are always local. Another in nice thing about it is you do not have to convert your indices. All of the indices in A stay global indices. So you, you actually save a lot of this complicated setup thing where you have to figure out what is the mapping of global to local indices. And what you now do is you essentially just figure out, you know, why are uh, this mod diff operation, uh, what is the processing element from which I need to get my X value and what is the offset there, right? So we start with parallel four, we go over my number of rows, we figure out, you know, the row offset, we go, uh, we go through there. We figure out the index of that, which is the global index. Right? Uh, then from that, via just the divide operation, we figure out which PE that index is owned by. 
we figure out the offset on that PE from with the mod operation. And then we just access x via PE comma k. Okay, and that's it. So how does the MPI skeleton look like? The MP, uh, or how does the PGAS skeleton look like compared to the MPI skeleton with, which filled the whole kind of space here? Uh, the skeleton is just dispatching that call, right? That parallel four. And potentially fencing your remote memory space afterwards or before that you make sure that, you know, uh, all the updates have happened. But that's it. There's actually some performance data here we collected on, uh, this is actually on Lassen, which is kind of like summer, just with fewer GPUs per NVLink complex. And uh, let me talk about this right picture here first, which is the number of lines of code for full CD, full CG solve, right? And uh, what happened is what we compared here to is an MPI with CUDA, which actually does all the overlapping correct, right? It, which is actually more complex than you may think, because it means also that you, that you now need to figure out, uh, you need to split your Perl for loop, right? And uh, into the part which does the, uh, does only access local X values, you know, and the part which accesses remote X values. But that is not determined by rows individually, right? You potentially have to do that. You have to figure out for every row, you know, who is remote and who is not remote and stuff like that. But the base takeaway is that the entire CG solve with, expressed with Cocos and Envishmem is actually smaller than just the MPI communication part of the optimized MPI code, right? Uh, and the computation kernel looks also more complex because you have the split into multiple kernels, you know, the interior versus exterior, exterior and stuff like that. So all in all, it's almost a 6x reduction in code. Now, performance-wise, uh, first we looked at, you know, what happens on just a single GPU, you know, does that kill you much? And you lose some performance, right? But it's not like terrible, terrible. When you stay within the same NVLink complex, right, you still have roughly the same ratio in terms of performance. And while we could only go to two GPUs in the same NVLink complex here on Lassen, there are machines like these DGX boxes where you can go significantly further, right, where you have up to like 16 GPUs in a single NVLink complex, and where the scaling actually goes longer. Now, when we scaled this thing to four GPUs, first of all, uh, even MPI didn't improve your performance anymore, right? So you actually were better off running on two GPUs than on four GPUs. But the drop off for NVshmem was significantly larger than for the MPI one because uh, the latency of accessing elements one by one, you know, via the kind of PCI or the, the, the connection between the power sockets, uh, you know, is, is quite high. But what we're doing is we're actually working with an NVIDIA on, on improving that. So we've, we are working on schemes like aggregation and caching of values and stuff like that, which uh, should help us uh, close some of these gaps further. Uh, and, you know, the question is, do future networks look more like these DGX boxes, right? Or are, uh, are bigger machines, you know, ending up with, even larger like super nodes, you know, where you have essentially a machine of like DGX boxes or something like that, right, in the end. And if that's true, right, then in particular within one of these tightly coupled complexes, we believe that this kind of remote space programming uh, has a lot of benefits in particular, you know, in terms of like code complexity and what you can express there. Okay, uh, we actually have an, uh, an exercise example for that. Uh, in order to do that, you need to download uh, the, the remote spaces repository. Uh, you then can configure it, you know, with like different backends, uh, nvshmem, shmem, or mbi space. Uh, note, if you compile with nvshmem, you know, you have to tell it, you know, where to find the nvshmem. While the basic shmem is potentially built into your MPI compiler, right? Uh, that may be true, it may be not true, it needs to be enabled, right? So that's uh, sometimes a bit funky, uh, whether that works or not. Uh, the MPI one side should always work. Uh, 
setting one of these spaces and able it actually tells you also the default remote memory space, right? So that thing exists always as a as a kind of uh, you know configuration uh, agnostic way of figuring out what your remote memory space is. And basically, what we have here as the exercise is just implementing that distributed vector shift we talked earlier about. And uh, so you, you know, just point to the uh, correct places and then do that. If you have questions on that, please come to, as if you really want to try that, you know, please come to our office hours on Tuesday and we'll help you with that because this stuff is not necessarily completely trivial. Okay, uh, as summary, with Cocos remote space at distributed shared memory to Cocos, it essentially allows you to get that by just uh, using a different memory space for your for your views. And what then happens is that the view operator will then do put get do put get kind of semantic access uh, in these remote spaces. And you can use deep copy to move data between memory spaces. This is something generally, as I said, this is in its early stages. We really would appreciate feedback on that too, uh, you know, in terms of what would, would it make more usable? You know, what kind of functionality do you need? Uh, for example, one thing we are considering is whether we should have uh, a thing where you can just index with your global index into it without figuring out what the PE is and we do it underneath with, with diff mod operations. But our early experiments showed that that actually has a surprising uh, funny overhead. Uh, because you can do some, some stuff a bit more clever than that, uh, the figuring out which PE things are coming from, basically via things like bit mask and stuff like that. But for that, you need to do that manually, right? In a generic way, it's not possible. And so, um, you know, we are considering that. Uh, there's other things like, for example, uh, you know, what kind of bulk transfer patterns would you like and stuff like that. So, you know, if you want to try that, please let us know and we'll help you uh, get set up do it. Okay, with that, we are reaching the end of today's uh, lecture. Uh, what we looked at today is that we looked at MPI and Cocos interaction, uh, and obviously the PGAS we just talked about, but the MPI, you know, simple MPI hopefully stays pretty simple. You just get the data pointers out of your views and uh, pass them to MPI and everything kind of works. Uh, and you can also overlap communication and computation if you are careful, you know, in which order you issue operations and potentially use like execution space instances. We also talked about the Fortran language compatibility layer, which gives you uh, capabilities to interoperate with Fortran. You can think, do things like initialize Cocos and finalize Cocos from Fortran. You can, uh, you know, create something. You can essentially create uh, this ND array T thing from a, from a, from a Fortran array and then hand that to a C function, which allows you to see the memory of the Fortran array as a, through a Cocos view. Uh, you can also allocate things like Cocos dual views in Fortran and hand them off to C++ functions. We also discussed the Python interoperability, which is a pre-release feature of Cocos, uh, you know, where you should ask us for access if you're willing to work with us a bit on you know, getting that thing finished for the final, you know, for the public release. Uh, similar to the Fortran thing, you can initialize and finalize Cocos from Python. You can create views in Python, uh, and you can also alias Cocos views with NumPy arrays. Next week, we gonna uh, go and talk about tools. We're gonna talk about things like the Clang Tidy we have in our works and uh, it's actually available to the public now, which allows you to do like static analysis and get like Cocos specific warnings in your IDE. We're gonna talk about Cocos tools. We're gonna both talk about like the debugging and profiling and tuning interfaces and, and capabilities. And we're gonna talk about uh, uh, custom and 3D party tools. Uh, which doesn't have anything to do with distributed code or global arrays, but as uh, you know, it's essentially how uh, how you write your own Cocos tools and how you interface, you know, with Cocos tools infrastructure with things like uh, Inside Compute and and Vtune and stuff like that. Don't forget, join our Slack channel and drop into our office hours on Tuesday. Uh, in particular, if you want to do a remote spaces exercise. 
And uh, you know, for updates, see the lecture updates, and for recording and slides, see the lectures. And thank you for being here again. Thank you for attending and keeping with us. Uh, I'll hope to see you next week again. But if there are still questions, we can answer them now after the recording is off. Thank you. See you next week.